first keynote speaker is Michael Ducker. There he is. Uh, he is a senior vice president with hydrogen infrastructure at Mitsubishi Power Americas. And he is going to talk to us a little bit about the market as it stands now and where it's going in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction. So anyway, as we were saying, over the course of that decade, more centralized power plants were constructed and ultimately transmission lines uh, were created that really connected the nation. Initially, we were looking at just 13 miles of transmission lines when this first took off. Yet here we stand today at over 5.5 million transmission lines across our entire country. And it doesn't stop there. If we continue to look at history, we've shown that we are able and capable of massive energy and infrastructure buildouts when challenged to do so. Take a look at Eisenhower's interstate highway system. In just 40 years, we connected an entire nation through a road system that was just an idea a few years before that. We can even look at natural gas pipelines. In the 1950s, we had just 25,000 miles of natural gas pipelines across all of North America. Yet by the end of the century, in the US alone, we could stretch our pipeline network from the earth to the moon and back twice. The point is, is when we step up to the challenge of massive infrastructure build out, history has shown that no feat is too big. Separately, it is by our very human nature to evolve and to adapt when faced with unprecedented stress and challenges. Combine these underlying facts together and we are at the mark of a new era and a definitive change in our relationship with energy. We both need to and we are capable of a massive energy transition unlike anything seen before. And of course, as we all know, the role of hydrogen and the role of each of you in this room will play an incredibly important part in this next chapter of our industry. So before I go too far, let's actually rewind a little bit and go back to the early 2000s. This is actually where my story with hydrogen began. I was a young engineer living in Washington, DC, commuting back and forth between State College, Penn State, uh, dating my now wife, uh, and really just enjoying what a 20 something year old doesn't realize the freedoms they've gotten to actually reflecting on it roughly 20 years later. Uh, I was working at the US Department of Energy and this is where we started to see this idea and you know, for those who've been in the industry a long time around the hydrogen economy. Now, President Bush's policies at that time were a bit more focused on its use in vehicles. I was actually studying its use in power plants. One of the first papers that I authored and studied was looking at integrating an autothermal reformer with a natural gas combined cycle for pre-combustion capture of CO2 using polymer uh, membranes. Very exciting stuff, I know. It's a few guys' eyes rolled, uh, glazed over there, I can see. But hear me out. What we were looking at in the early 2000s was the opportunity for hydrogen to achieve cost-effective and deep decarbonization. But the markets and society had a much different answer. Hydrogen was not the answer. Instead, what did we see? We saw significant subsidies for renewables, largely backed by corporate PPAs, which saw the takeoff of that industry. We saw new regulations come into place for coal-fired facilities that ultimately lent to a lot of their retirements. And of course, we saw a national shale boom that dramatically changed energy prices plummeting in our landscape as we knew it. Looking back now, we can see how we were actually able to achieve significant decarbonization. Really, we think about this uh, past 15 years or so as the first wave of decarbonization. But it's not enough, not even remotely enough, given the goals that we've stepped up to today. Some of the other important underlying facts that we need to understand is, as we look at renewables, they were never designed nor intended to support baseload generation or helping to decarbonize multiple verticals, especially as we all call it, the hard to evade verticals. Let's look at coal fired power plants. Just in California, one of the nation's most progressive states when it comes to carbon policies, is just slated to retire its last coal fired power plant this upcoming year, yet still has a tremendous way to go to achieve its target of a 40% reduction in carbon emissions by the end of this decade. And of course, as a lot of folks in this room understand, we are sitting on one of the world's largest reserves of natural gas. Unless we can find a way to effectively and to cost effectively decarbonize this resource, it's a tremendous lost opportunity. So why are we here? 
It's simple in that we're seeking to solve a problem more than a century in the making within one generation. It's complicated in that the strategy and the playbook we've taken here to date is not the same approach we can take moving forward. Think about that again. A century created challenge. We need to solve it in one lifetime. That's what the world is committed to. That's what corporations, states, countries, that's what the entire world has committed to. And that's why we are ultimately here in this room. But I'll try to take that one step even deeper. Truly, why are we here? Why are you here? To what purpose, to what end? I can tell you for myself, that answer is actually quite simple and easy. It's personal. The reason that I'm stepping up with this generational challenge is because of this. My kids right there, all three of them, Mikey, Evie, Teddy, uh, I actually give a pretty funny story just from this past weekend on Sunday. My son, the big one there, the six-year-old that looks like he's about 12, uh, we're watching Planet Earth and listening to Sir David Attenborough you know, discuss climate change and the impact it's having in the world. And my six-year-old poses a question to me, very simple, Dad, what's climate change? So trying to explain climate change to a six-year-old, uh, a little bit challenging, I instead took it into a great opportunity to better discuss with him what are we doing here in this room and talk about the exciting impacts that we are making in this world to try to deliver clean energy and go back to what daddy is doing for his work. But what I actually realized in that moment was not only was it a source of pride and excitement to talk with my son and ultimately my kids about the incredible work we're doing and the impact it's making, but I realized in that moment how important it was for me to see the impact our work specifically is having on him in future generations. So that's my why. We've covered very personal why, as well as the structural whys around hydrogen. We've talked about how we both need to and are capable of massive energy transition. Now let's focus in a little bit more on hydrogen. We coined the phrase the hydrogen compass. And what we're using here is really just trying to look at our strategies reflect on what we've done here to date, and also uh, look at the base elements and properties of hydrogen and pull that together really into a layout and a compass for moving forward in solving this generational challenge. And the three synergies and the three areas we see combining strategy and element are be first, be collaborative, and be abundant. So let's start with being first. As everyone in this room full well knows, hydrogen is our first element on the periodic table. And analogous to our industry, it's critical for each of us in this room looking at taking that first mover step. Moving when we've got imperfect answers is difficult and it's challenging, but it's necessary. If I go back to 2019, which was feels like a completely different world than it is today, we're pre-COVID, we're pre-IRA, we're pre the tremendous uh, ground swells we've seen around hydrogen, what we ultimately did in 2019 was actually get into a joint venture with a company, Magnum Development, and we sought to develop the world's first and largest clean integrated hydrogen hub. I actually remember back to 2019 and when we discussed this investment, some of the conversations and feedback I got. I was told that we were throwing away our money. I was told this was a science experiment. I was told this was the hydrogen economy failure all over again. And this is literally just a little more than three years ago. Yet here I stand today and we've delivered. We closed in June of 2022 on the world's first and largest integrated clean hydrogen production and storage hub. With 100 metric tons per day of electrolytically produced hydrogen and 11,000 metric tons of hydrogen storage, we will be the world's largest single storage site for any type of hydrogen, clean or not. And we were the largest renewable hydrogen project under construction as of close of last year. We also closed on the Department of Energy's first loan in over a decade for $504 million. And we are serving as a model for the world's first market application of seasonal energy storage. The scale and magnitude of this project is hard to do justice in photos alone, but just to quickly run through a few, uh, we completed our drilling just this past summer for both of our caverns ahead of schedule. At nearly a mile beneath the earth, we're constructing caverns the size of the Empire State Building with little more than a show for it than a 15 foot tall wellhead above ground. Our hydrogen capable gas turbines arrived at site 
uh, just this past in July at our partner site, and our construction continues on the above ground facilities. And very exciting, literally just last week, the electrolyzers just started rolling in on train cars. And as we sit here and speak today, they're being installed at site. Our ACES Delta project is a flagship example of being first, both pragmatically, but more importantly, what it means in this industry is we need first movers. Act when we've got incomplete answers. Act when others criticize. That's what it's going to take if we're going to solve a problem more than a century in the making and do it in a single lifetime. At Mitsubishi Power, we made a conscious decision to actively shape this market rather than sit on the sidelines. And we're calling out for others in this market to continue to do so on the first mover side. Now, moving past hydrogen's elements of being the first on the uh, periodic table, we look at hydrogen properties in that it is rarely, if ever, found in its pure form. Hydrogen's natural state is to be collaborative. Combine it with a carbon molecule, we've got natural gas. Combine hydrogen with oxygen, and we've got water. Combine hydrogen with, with nitrogen, and we've got ammonia. The name of the game is collaboration, and that's going to be paramount to success in this industry. I always say one of the coolest parts of my job is the diverse set of stakeholders I get to collaborate to try to get a project to the finish line. From power to mobility to heavy industrial users, from electrolyzer manufacturers to reformer providers, from renewable energy suppliers to natural gas suppliers, and from US ports to European ports. The collaboration landscape for this molecule is vast, and as we all full well know in this space, to get jobs, to, the, to get projects to the finish line, it requires that type of work. Taking it one step further, at Mitsubishi Power, we've run significant amount of studies and views of looking at hydrogen's collaborative uses in the power markets, particularly how to get deeper decarbonization. And what we see time and again from our studies from the West Coast to Texas to individual utilities is when hydrogen is included in the energy mix as a decarbonized energy asset, we're able to achieve greater carbon reductions at lower system-wide energy costs with more reliability. In just our Texas study alone, we were able to show upwards of a 20% system-wide energy cost reduction with less system overbuilds and less uh, curtailments. More efficient, lower costs. But even moving beyond the use cases for hydrogen, just looking at the collaborative ways we can look at producing it. As we all full well know in this room, what works in one part of the country may not be the most viable and socioeconomically valuable approach in a different part of the country. That's why at Mitsubishi Power, we have focused on delivering clean hydrogen, period. We're seeking the lowest carbon intensity and the lowest cost to deliver to our stakeholders. As a great example, if we look at our ACES Delta project in the Western United States, we're underpinned by some of the nation's most abundant and low cost renewable energy. And this is where producing hydrogen via electrolysis makes sense. Conversely, if we look in the Appalachia region where I'm from, we see some of the nation's largest reserves of natural gas. And we're working on a project to produce hydrogen with carbon capture and storage from natural gas, ultimately serving polymer manufacturing and power generation. The point is, there's not a one size fit all. We have diverse stakeholders, diverse regions, and coming up with the opportunity to be collaborative in the ways we produce hydrogen is going to be incredibly important. Now, the last parallel we like to look at between molecule and strategy is be abundant. As the most abundant element in the entire universe, it is no coincidence of hydrogen's role in helping us to achieve a cleaner energy future. Bridging that to our industry, we can look no further than when we continue to see time and again, with abundance, with scale, comes cost down. And we can look no further than the renewables industry. We saw at the earlier part of this decade, renewables at their takeoff point. Costs were in the thousands of dollars a megawatt hour. It made no sense to install renewables. Yet as we talked about, we saw policies that were providing incentives to back renewables and corporations ultimately backing it. And we saw the takeoff of an industry. And with that abundance came a precipitous drop in price. And it was a self-feeding cycle as we continue to see. Now, we all full well know that hydrogen very likely is expected to take that same path. That's not a point that I expect to be news to anybody in this room. But one of the more critical factors and questions to look at is implicitly 
behind here, the debate we're having today, which is what will IRA guidance look like? A lot's being discussed right now with the IRA around topics like additionality, temporality, and regionality. What I challenge is this. If we look back to the early 2000s and renewables were mandated to have an additionality of new transmission lines to support their growth, would we have seen the carbon reductions and renewable price declines that we see today? If we go back to the early 2000s and corporations mandated that every one of their virtual renewable PPAs had to be both time-stamped and locationally stamped to the actual uses for their facilities, would we have seen the carbon reductions and price reductions we see today? No doubt it's going to be important to solve this generational challenge with first movers, with collaboration, and with abundance. And part of the abundance story looks at making sure we have policies that adequately support achieving that scale. Looking a little bit more inward at ourselves as a company, we are personally invested in helping to solve the abundance equation, and we're doing so in action through our Takasago Hydrogen Park, which is the world's first integrated hydrogen validation facility, which seeks to take new technologies and advanced technologies from, power, from hydrogen production to hydrogen power generation and validate it. One of our fundamental beliefs is that in achieving abundance and scale, it's first important to instill confidence. And with that confidence, as we test and validate, industries can more rapidly scale, and that's how we're stepping up to the abundance challenge. Be first, be collaborative, be abundant. No doubt over the course of the next few days, we'll have many conversations around our energy landscape in North America and how critical it is for us to achieve both affordable and reliable energy while at the same time achieving a sustainable society for our future. That's the challenge of this generation. And so as I look out in this room to each and every one of you, I say that it's going to be incredible, incredibly important that you move forward in this space with incomplete answers and making decisions when it's hard to act. That's what it means to be a first mover. Everyone in this room look first to your left and then look to your right and have both the humility and the understanding that it, you will likely need to partner in some way, shape, or form with the person next to you in order to make things a reality in the space. That's what it means to be collaborative. And it's going to take literally this entire room of contributors and companies to even remotely begin to build the scale that's necessary to achieve this generational challenge. That's what it means to be abundant. And the last thing I'll say to each and every one of you in this room is find your why. Maybe it's for your kids or your grandkids or the community around you. Maybe it's trying to make this world a little bit better place than the way you found it in. Or maybe it's just doing something, feeling to be a little bit bigger than yourself. Whatever your why may be, find it and let's continue to work together on the how.